All right. You okay. can't do this to me right before I'm about to start. Welcome to Good. Free Association, <laughs> the NPR podcast. You know what? I'm starting over. Okay. Welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by train directions. I have been all over Europe over the past couple of months, and I find that every time I go into a subway system, try to figure out where I'm going, inevitably I always get on the wrong direction. Am I the only one that this happens to? I do that too. Yeah. You know, and the thing that really bothers me locally, that's sort of the analog of that, is like the wacky signage in Inbound Massachusetts. And outbound? Well, well, not on trains. Like when you get onto Route 95 mm-hmm. and you're merging in from Waltham and it says like, you know, Providence and Attleboro. And you're like, what? 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 what like, what are we <laughs> into like the next town over? <laughs> It's true. It's true, but you're like, right. Where about, is Alabara? But, do I want to go there? <laughs> you do. I want to go to. You, I want you to do. go home. No, you want to go to Attleboro. You always want to go to Attleboro. But you are right that the trains in Boston are particularly confusing because they don't. They're designated based on inbound and outbound. Right. Which once you get past, if there's you're a going point inbound, at which it's not clear what that then means. Then suddenly, at some point, you're going outbound. Right. It's all relative to Park Street. It's all <laughs> relative and wrong. Anyway. I am Matt Fox from the Departments of Epidemiology and Global Health at the Boston University School of Public Health. And I'm here with Chris Gill, as always. Good day. And Donthea is away, and we uh, have a special guest with us for the next couple of episodes, one of our uh, previous guest hosts, Dr. Jennifer Ryder. Hello. We're so glad to have you, Jennifer. Very Thank glad you for joining to have you. Thank you. And as always, we are here in the Godly Studio, but the difference between this week and all other weeks is now we have a podcast cart, and Nick is very <laughs> upset about it, and... Uh, Whoever made the cart is going to get a nasty surprise, apparently. What, what's a cart? <laughs> <laughs> it's a oh, thing. Oh, an actual cart. It's you a, didn't notice <laughs> this? Oh, okay. I thought you meant like, like, a, like an Amazon cart. No, no, no. It's, a, it's an actual <laughs> cart. Wow. And Nick's not happy about it. Um, so uh, as a reminder, head on over to the Population Health Exchange website, which is B's hub for lifelong learning. And also go ahead and give us a rating on iTunes. And I am so excited to let you guys know we have new ratings. We have new uh, uh, reviews. Are we on iTunes now? I, or we've findable, been on, I mean? We've been findable. On a, uh, we're not findable, are we? If you found us... Be Somehow. glad that you found us. <laughs> but we got we, the reason is that Nick found uh, there's there's some way that we have a better way of figuring out our ratings, and they provide all of the comments or the reviews from all the different iTunes, not just the U.S. one. And it turns out there have been some that have been hiding from us. So we got one that says, "I've been listening to all your episodes. Can I please have a mug?" <laughs> I, I've Bean educated, B E E, and then the N in parentheses. So that oh, one is for you. That's funny. That one is for that's you. That's funny. Um, <laughs> let's see. Interesting coverage of recent papers and useful skills in evidence based medicine and statistics. Worth a listen. That was from the Great Britain, those two. Uh, okay, then. The, I'm gonna, did I'm you gonna, say the Great Britain? From. I said the Great Britain. I did. Yeah, I did. I didn't mean it. But no, I did no, it's say, good. I like it. We should okay, go with that from now on. Let's try this. Data. Uh, <laughs> Er den beste Podcasten um Medicinskis Forstnig. That's Norwegian, apparently. I put it into Google Translate, and that is very good. This is the best podcast on medical research. Oh, so so true. There are a couple others. I won't read them all, but the point is there are other ones out there that we never knew about. So now on to the show. So today in our first segment, which is our Journal Club segment, we're going to talk about a study of the relationship between sugary drinks and the risk of cancer. And I will just tell you ahead of time, Chris is feisty about this one. <laughs> I had promised him we weren't going to do any more dietary studies, and I snuck this one in, so he's he's pretty unhappy. I guess it's a drinkatory study. A drinkatory. There you go. So that doesn't count. So and then in the second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive, we'll talk about how to improve nutrition research. And I just want to be clear, Chris, that that was your idea, the second part. And we paired it with the first one. So you were aware that this was going to happen. I just want to point that out. And then in our Amazing and Amusing, we will uh, get into some things that make us laugh out loud. Or Chris will tell us how something related to bees. I don't know. You got bees this time? No, I'm going to talk about bees. I'm going to talk about Incas. Incas. Even better. (laughs) All right. So, all right. Segment one. So we're going to talk about an article on the risk of cancer in relation to sugary drink consumption published in the BMJ. 
It was entitled Sugary Drink Consumption and Risk of Cancer Results from the Nutrinet Santé Prospective Cohort by first author Eloi Chazelier. Thank you. Chazelier? Chazelier. We'll go with that. <laughs> Possibly. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> and Bernard Schroer. This is this, so my 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 <laughs> oldest daughter is taking French, and she has taken. She will sit at the dinner table and speak to me in French, which I do not understand. But she will do it in her in her worst French accent that she can possibly do. So not only do I not understand. Does she say this in English? She no. She speaks in <laughs> French, but with a, an American uh, accent. Uh, gotcha. And I so I can't understand a word of it. Anyway, so they're from the Sorbonne Paris Cité Epidemiology and Statistics Research Center. So. Some of the headlines on this one, hard truths about soft drinks. That was from MSN. Hmm. (laughs) Yahoo Finance USA says drinking fruit juice may raise cancer risk study claims. Having too many sugary drinks linked to high cancer risk. That was the New York Post. And Medical Health News says sugar drinks may, quote, represent a modifiable risk factor for cancer prevention. So I don't know what to make of any of those. So Jen, are you able to uh, enlighten us and tell us what that study was about? I will do my best. So there have been a variety of studies that have looked at the association between sugary drinks and cardiometabolic health. So we know that drinking sugar-sweetened beverages is not particularly good in terms of weight gain or obesity or type 2 diabetes or hypertension or even cardiovascular-related death. There have also been a number of studies on artificially sweetened beverages and cardiometabolic outcomes, and um, that also is bad news, I mm-hmm. would say, in terms of obesity, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. Mm-hmm. Not um, good. And it's the, and one of the mechanisms, interestingly, that's been proposed is that um, they might actually increase glucose intolerance through changes in the gut microbiome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But there have been very few studies relatively of sugar-sweetened beverages and cancer, uh, despite some mechanisms that are compelling. So, of course, many cancers are related to obesity, so it could be a mechanism through obesity. But even independent of obesity, it is thought that sugar-sweetened beverages could increase uh, cancer risk through insulin resistance because Mm -hmm. they have a very high glycemic index or glycemic load. And there are also a lot of other compounds in sugar-sweetened beverages besides the sugar Mm -hmm. um, that could have adverse health effects. A limited number of prospective studies have looked at sugar-sweetened beverages and cancer, and they've had pretty mixed results. And another limitation of those prior studies is that um, they have tended to put both sugar-sweetened beverages and artificially sweetened beverages in the same category Mm -hmm. and not looked at those separately. So the authors of this study were interested in doing a prospective evaluation of sugar-sweetened beverages, which include 100% fruit juice, but then also another category of all other sugar-sweetened beverages. So those would be like your sports drinks, sweetened milk products, and then also looking separately at artificially sweetened beverages with respect to overall cancer, and then the uh, cancers that were most common in this cohort, so that's breast, prostate, and colorectal. Mm -hmm. So they used this uh, Nutrinet Sante uh, cohort, which is a web-based cohort that was launched in uh, 2009. Participants had to be at least 18 years old and have access to the internet. They were recruited from uh, mass media campaigns, and they were able to recruit 101,257 participants into this study. That's a lot. It's a lot. It's a really large study. It's interesting. 79% of the participants are female. And the mean age at baseline was 41 in uh, the women and 47 in the in the men. So pretty pretty young for a cancer study. The participants filled out a set of five different web-based self-administered uh, questionnaires uh, that covered a variety of things: um, so- socio-demographics, lifestyle, anthropometric measurements, diet, physical activity, health status, uh, and they did validate the web-based versions of these questionnaires against the traditional paper mm-hmm. paper-based versions. In terms of the dietary assessment, that was conducted at baseline and then every six months after that. At each assessment, they requested three 24-hour dietary recalls from non-consecutive days uh, that were randomly assigned over a two-week period. And uh, they wanted one of those days to be a weekend day and the other two to be uh, weekdays so that then that exposure history could be weighted to reflect a week's Mm -hmm. intake. 
at least two of those dietary recalls were required for inclusion in the study. They uh, evaluated 97 different sugary drink items and then 12 different artificially sweetened beverages. And one unique thing about this online cohort is that the participants were invited, it was voluntary, but if they wanted, they could participate in a clinical examination. And at that clinical examination, they did a a number of different tests, but one of them was an assessment of visceral fat using um, a calibrated impedance body analyzer. And actually, over 15,000 of these 101,000 participants had a visceral fat measurement available. So in terms of the cancer outcomes, those were um, initially self-reported by the participants, and there were a variety of ways that they could do that through the regularly administered questionnaires or just whenever they wanted through the, uh, the web interface. But then all incident reports of cancer were followed up by a study physician who then requested medical records. Um, and they were able to retrieve medical records from 90% of the incident cancer uh, reports. And then there was 95% concordance between self-report and um, the medical record. In terms of the statistical analysis, they used fine and gray uh, regression to account for competing risks. That may be something we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. They looked at both continuous levels of intake of the beverages based on uh, increments of 100 milliliters a day for the sugar-sweetened beverages and then 10 milliliters a day for the artificially sweetened beverages. They also looked at sex-specific quartiles of consumption, and they adjusted for um, a large number of potential confounders that they had collected on these baseline questionnaires. They did some stratified analyses to look at the potential interaction with uh, baseline BMI or weight change over the study period, uh, and also with smoking. And then um, they also did some secondary analyses that related uh, the sugar-sweetened beverage consumption to visceral adiposity. So, should we get into the results? Go for it. Yeah, tell us what they find. Okay, so first of all, they had a mean number of dietary recalls from each participant of uh, 5.6, up to 15 per participant. Compared to the lower consumers of sugar-sweetened beverages, um, higher consumers tended to be, it's it's kind of an interesting mix of characteristics. Um, It actually was kind of strange. It was uh, counterintuitive, I thought. Yeah, you can't really call them healthier or unhealthier, I think. So they tended to be younger and more educated. So these are the higher consumers compared to the lower consumers, Uh, but less physically active, less cancer family history, less prevalent cardiometabolic disease, but then higher uh, intakes of energy, carbohydrates, lipids, and sodium, lower alcohol intake, which also makes sense. Because they're drinking something else. Because they're drinking something else, exactly. And then a higher proportion of um, current smokers. Mm -hmm. About half of the beverage consumption that was looked at was due to fruit juices. So 45% fruit juice, and then the, um, and 36% due to other sugary beverages. Um, Only 19% of the cohort reported drinking artificially sweetened beverages. And then over a follow-up, a mean follow-up of 5.1 years, maximum 8.8 years, so not a long time for cancer, they observed 2,193 incident cancers. Uh, Those broke down into about 700 breast cancers, just under 300 prostate cancers, and then 166 colorectal cancers. So because they did fine and gray regression, what they're reporting are sub-distribution hazard ratios. So the sub-distribution hazard ratio for a 100 milliliter increase per day in any type of sugary drink was 1.18 for overall cancer and 1.22 for breast cancer. Um, Both of those were statistically significant. Not that we care about that. (laughs) And uh, they didn't find associations for any of the other um, specific cancer type. Then they broke it down and said, okay, what about the different types of sugar-sweetened beverages? So for 100% fruit juice, they found a subdistribution hazard ratio of 1.12 with a confidence interval of 1.03 to 1.23 for overall cancer. Breast cancer was also elevated, you know, at about the same, um, Mm -hmm. this point estimate was very similar, but not statistically significant. And then when they looked at other sweetened beverages, they found an increased rate of overall cancer of 1.19 and 1.23 for breast cancer. They found no associations overall or with any of the cancer types for artificially sweetened beverages. Which Um, is kind of weird. It is really weird. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's really weird. Anyway, sorry, keep going. Yeah, so just a couple more things. So um, they also looked at the consumption of sugar from sugary drinks, and they found that that was also associated with both overall cancer and breast cancer. And then when they put sugar from sugary drinks into their main model, the association with the beverage intake went away, suggesting that it's really sugar that's that's the driver mm-hmm. of this association. Mm-hmm. And then in that subset of the cohort that did have Uh, visceral adiposity measurements, sugary beverage consumption was associated with an increase in visceral adiposity. So I can, I can stop there. Okay. I, so before, before we get into the critique of the study, I just want to, I want to say two things. The first is that we had a little bit of a discussion before we got started and we have a diversity (laughs) of opinions in the room about the quality of this study. And uh, you can't see us physically, but I'm sitting in the middle. So I will uh, be the referee (laughs) for this one. (laughs) The second point is, so this got a lot of attention on Twitter for a reason that you might not suspect. I mean, it got some criticism for the study itself. Probably there was some positive. I didn't see it, but a lot of negative criticism. But in particular, there was criticism of the study because the study was pre-registered in the mm. sense that it was this was a you know registered in clinicaltrials.gov even though it wasn't a trial it's not a clinical analysis. Trial, right. However, the criticism was they pre-registered everything. They essentially uh, they mm-hmm. essentially said we are going to compare every expo- every nutritional exposure to every possible outcome Oof. including and I have to say I can't find any evidence of this but this was the the tweet that I was reading including the effect of diet on height in people over the age of 18 which is Kind of weird. You wouldn't think they've that stopped growing. You wouldn't think there's going to have a lot of impact. Anyway, so the point being there. So no, I guess if it did, that would be interesting. It would be super interesting. <laughs> like really, wow. But the point being, the criticism was, you know, essentially they just said, "Let's throw Maybe everything at the wall." Maybe they were thinking of shrinking rather than growing. It definitely could be. Yeah. I don't. I don't. Wow. I don't want to judge. I mean, they 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 mentioned early on that they they assessed 3,300 dietary items. Yeah. And if you just like so you got a do lot. two by two pairings. Right. So you, that's, you, um, you, that's you a do lot have to think a little bit about items. the. Multiple exposure problem. Anyway, so with that in mind, Chris, give us your take a deep breath, okay, and then I, launch I, into it. I I I, I, I want to start by saying I'm I actually am not concerned about the quality of the study. I thought the okay. the, the methodology was a plus plus. So I I mean I thought like you know they they literally go on for pages and pages with the, with their you know the description of the statistical methods, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and most of it I I I didn't really feel qualified to to uh, critique, but the volume of it certainly impressed the heck out of me. <laughs> So, um, so I'm, I'm going to stipulate that in my impression, my uninformed impression, I think they, they probably did the math as well as can possibly mm-hmm. be done. Mm-hmm. Now, with that said, my, my universal critique of dietary studies is that, that I'm, I'm so skeptical of the idea that you can ever isolate the effect of one nutrient in isolation as if it does not exist in a web of, of networked dietary habits. And so when we're talking about orange juice or Coca-Cola or, you know, you know, saccharin sweetened tab, if that is still marketed, tab. Um, we're never really talking about one thing. We're talking about all sorts of things and they're not even just dietary things, but their habits. Yeah. So, um, and you know, they've con- controlled for a few dozen of those here, uh, and bravo. But when we have 3,300 items on their list, the web becomes vast and complicated and you cannot possibly control for that all. So I, I, I'm, I'm baseline skeptical because of that. And I don't really ever really know what are we in fact regressing against. And so let me spin that one step further. Okay. Because in their, their initial table here, table two, which is the big results table, they start with the observation that in the highest quartile of sugary drink consumption mm-hmm. versus the lowest, the risk of all cancers was increased by 30%, meaning that there was an odds ratio of 1.3. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Now, when they exclude, they, in the next category, they got into sugary drinks ex- except 100% fruit drinks, which means that we're talking about Coca-Cola, right? Sodas, basically, or milk, or the, which, energy drinks, or energy drinks, but but not fruit drinks. And I think I make that distinction because they assume, and we all assume, that juice for breakfast is better than Coke. Yeah, right. I would assume. Right. We would it not. It has fruit in it. For, for, <laughs> The Coke, Wait, the is Coke that, tree? Is that, <laughs> is that F-R-U-I-T or F-R-O-O-T? I think we're talking about Coke berries, right. So, um, the no, Coke, she's the, talking the about the juice, tree. not the oh, right, Coke. Right, but right, the Coke, right. So I, I, I would have like assumed that, that 
probably fruit juice better, fruit than, juice better than none, even though I understand that the, the villain is sugar yep. mm-hmm. by whatever source. Yep. But, you know, there's this huge literature about antioxidants, man, and how great they are for preventing cancer. And fruit juices that got them and Coke doesn't got them. So what's up with that? What's up with that? That, doesn't, that seems yeah. totally counterintuitive. That like I can't tell you what the an- antioxidant content of your regular glass of orange juice is, but I'm betting it's pretty low. Mm. Right. I, yeah. It could be, could be like, I mean, it's got vitamin C. Some of that. So, oh, so there you go. Um, so, done. But be that as it may, you know, I could say, well, maybe it goes the other way because fruits get covered with ergot, you know, what, what is that funky rye fungus that causes liver cancer? You know what he's talking about? Nope. There's nope. a, there's a, and it lives on nuts and grains and causes aflatoxin, That's aflatoxin. That's you stuff. know, maybe, maybe tangerines have got aflatoxin on them and mm-hmm. they, they, you get cancer from aflatoxin. Mm-hmm. It's not really the sugar. It's the, but, but the thing is that the risk goes, goes down to almost no risk once you take out the, no increased the fruit risk. juice. No right, increased no risk. No increased risk. Yep. So we're, we're saying like, does that mean that Coke is better for you than orange juice? That seems weird. And then when you go down to the artificial artificially sweetened beverages, there's no, you know, there's actually a significant decrease relative to the lowest in cry, like a relative risk of 0.6, uh, an odds ratio of 0.68 at the third quartile. You know, I mean, it's, it's not a consistent trend. We'll, yeah. we'll stipulate there, but it's, mm. it, you know, this is all bouncing around all over the map. So you say like, well, wait a minute, does that mean that tab is better than orange juice? I, I mean, like all of this is now starting to make, you know, stretch my credulity. It's like, I'm thinking, okay, I'm back to my web of interactive nutrients thing. And I don't really know that I'm talking about fruit juices versus Coke versus aspartame versus saccharin versus water anymore. Are we maybe all talking about, in fact, the big, the big picture coming out of this is that kids should be having beer for breakfast I because don't that think seems that, to be I, the counterfactual. Can I go on record <laughs> as saying I am not in favor of that? I just want to. I know you you are you are arguing for single malt, but I just want to um, say that I don't know Chris Gill. It also makes them mellow. It, Sends them off to school, very creative, very docile. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> anyway, I, I guess I'm saying so, I, I think the math is right, but I, I think. I'm still not persuaded by the results. They and just seem too wacky to me. And, 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 but can I push you just a little bit on this? Is it, are you saying, though, that your concern is uncontrolled confounding, that they did, they did everything they could possibly do, but you just can't undo it? It, it would be partly un, uh, you know, uncontrolled confounding, but I think it's also that, that there, are, there, are multi, there are bidirectional loops of causality that may exist in here, so that we're not just talking about an absolute... You know, that there's a linear relationship, but there are curvilinear relationships so that at different levels, the, the, you know, the biological impact of these things can go in exactly the opposite direction. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that adds another layer of complexity to this that makes the, the biology behind it awfully tricky for me to, to understand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and, you know, there, there, there are explanations up front about adiposity and maybe that increases testosterone and estrogen levels. And that's why you get more breast cancer. I could buy that. Yeah, sure. I totally buy that. I mean, it's not that their main finding astonished me. In fact, I would tend to believe it's probably true, whether it's causal. I, I'm not sure if I'm willing to go there, but mm-hmm. I, I think I think the rest of it just starts to fall apart when you look at the aggregate data okay. to me. Okay. All right. Jen, what's your take? So I actually, I like the study. Mm-hmm. I, I really like, I mean, I like that it was large. I like that they built in this analysis of visceral adiposity to try and get at mechanism. And I think that, you know, before the we started, you were talking a little bit about just nutritional epi in general and, you know, why this is important. And I think people consume fruit juice at breakfast every morning because they think it's a healthy choice. Yeah. Right. And I think that it's it may not be the healthiest choice. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe they should just consume fruit. Uh, or water. Or <laughs> water. On. Or let's, coffee. They actually make, a, make a here. point in here that coffee and... There was one other beverage Milk. that they looked at were not associated Milk. with very healthy stuff. <laughs> I think, though yeah. I shouldn't say that anymore. I, I don't believe anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we, should, we should stick to aflatoxin. Okay. At least we know that's bad for us. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah. Anyway. I also think one another point to touch on is um, I think the use of dietary recalls was really interesting. I I, I can't say whether it's better, but um, but the fact that they were able to get these participants to fill out on average, you know, five or six uh, twenty four hour dietary recalls r- rather than doing um, an FFQ, you know, they were. I think mm-hmm. there were a lot of efforts made to really have more accurate exposure um, measurement, which I appreciated. I think that 
the so the cohort is 79% female you know it looks like they had a good number of breast cancer cases for the other cancers i'm not really sure if we can draw any conclusions from that there just there just weren't that many cases and a relatively short follow up and the age of the cohort was a little bit young i think to um, to really look at some of those cancers particularly prostate yeah okay so i, I- and I, I agree with I, most of what you said there, actually. I, I fall somewhere in between you both on this one because I was – I thought they I, – I agree. I think they did they did quite a nice job with what they had. I think that they were quite thoughtful in the way they went about trying to deal with what we have talked about so many times on this program before. Dietary studies are always complicated. And I am with you, Chris. My, my, my prior on things goes to – you know, you're going to have to convince me. Um, that said, I, my prior on this was I could still believe that there is a small association. I, I'm not anticipating big effects. And in fact, when it comes to nutritional study, I start with the the prior that there is going to be, by definition, a fair bit of non-differential misclassification because we can't measure these things that well. If, on average, that bias is towards the null, then I wouldn't believe large effects to begin with because, on average, they should be larger, and I don't really believe that larger. So I'm looking for small effects. If I see big effects, I'm going to get skeptical to begin with. But I thought the picture was kind of mixed here in that, well, a couple of things. Number one is, as you said in the beginning, the the profile of these people was kind of strange. In that because it, they were French? No, no. Uh, and apologies to all of our French listeners. I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean. I, what I mean is that the, the higher consumers of, of sugary beverages were, um, on average, had more education, had uh, some, some things that would make you think they were healthier right. on average right. than the general population, uh, less, less family risk of cancer, I think. Right. Um, less fam- and less uh, cardiometabolic disease. So if anything, um, it should be going in the opposite direction. Well, well, but then there were other things that kind of didn't fit that. That pattern. It was kind of a weird thing. So you always talk about the more the roof smokers, rack. Right. right? Less right. physical activity. It's it's this strange mix. You always talk about the roof rack being the you know the 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 kayak roof rack and kayak roof and Whole rack Foods and the Whole Foods and and that you know they're the and and that is true. Like risk factors party together, so you get the good things and the bad things going together. In this case, it it kind of is a, a weird mix, and I don't know what to do with that. And it did make me wonder whether there's any possibility of some reverse causation going in here. That that there would be, and when I say reverse causation, I don't know exactly what I mean because I don't think that these people, you know, are dropping out of the study in any way because they have cancer. Because I don't think that would probably happen, but. Well, well, one of the things that, that that I jotted down in my notes here is that you know food and and you know unlike many exposure studies, it's a zero sum game generally, right? So you you said earlier, John, the that, way I eat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the plate, the, your cup runneth over. Is that what you're saying? Uh, just, um, just take so more. You, if, if you drink a glass of juice, you're probably going to drink one less glass of milk or water sure. right? or something. So it's the, the juice or is alcohol a mar- or alcohol, right? So it's a marker for something else that you didn't have. Mm-hmm. And so what would that other be thing? And if you take out the you know all sweetened beverages regardless of sugar content you know so we're including the you know the the saccharin drinks and the aspartame drinks if if that is a is up that means something else is down and maybe that, maybe but possibly yeah, but, but yeah. probably the, the thing that is down would be alcohol right and so if if you had rerun this entire analysis around wine and beer you know I could see the you know the alcohol a moderate alcohol is good for you crowd you know, blowing their trumpets here, saying that here is more evidence that that a beer a day or a glass of wine a day prevents cancer, because yeah. it would be the absence of sugary benefits equals the you know possibly on some level the one more glass of wine or one more mm-hmm, glass of beer, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and 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 the truth is I wouldn't believe that either, for the same reasons that I'm skeptical of this. Yeah, D- uh, dietary questions in general are complicated for that fact. So. Okay, so but but so let me go back here. So then, if you look at the 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 results, what what kind of throws me is a little bit is is as you said, the overall effect was you know comparing the highest quartile to the lowest quartile, comparing just looking at sugary drinks and all cancers was one point three, right. But if you separated that out and you only looked at artificially sweetened beverages, a big old null one point mm-hmm. zero, right. Okay, so we have something seemingly going on. For all cancers and sugary drinks, but it's not the artificially sweetened beverages. Then you drop down to breast cancer and comparing the highest quartile to the lowest quartile. Uh, overall, it's 1.37. About so the same. About the same. But then you go down to the just the artificially sweetened beverages, 1.33. Yeah. What's up with that? So 
yeah, what exactly is going on when they didn't seem to, they said they didn't find much else with, with any other type of cancer. So I don't know what's going on there. And I'm a little confused. Yeah, and, and 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 don't we also have this sort of you know nagging feeling that aspartame may not be so great for you? I do have that nagging feeling. Where does that come in here? Well, because the, you know the, the um, sweetened beverages, the, the, the fact that um, artificially sweetened that, that sweetened beverages, including Coca Cola, increase your risk of cancer, and yet uh, Coke Zero doesn't. Seems to like you know fly in the face oh, of my my uh, you know my mm. my pre my my, my pretest priors that I would have thought that the chemical sweeteners would also have some carcinogenic potential. Hmm. I mean I I don't know I don't know this literature but you know they they get kind of a bad reputation maybe undeservedly maybe in fact they are better than sugar. Yeah. But I'm I'm uh, based on these at least for cancer for cancer mm. right I'm but I'm not willing to go there because the skepticism applies to all of these. Yeah. All right so then then go over to prostate cancer because they said then yeah. they said there was no but there was no relationship to anything else. Right. Which I have to say I don't agree with. No, so if prostate you go to seems worse. Prostate cancer, the sugary uh, drinks except fruit juices. Well it's just sugary drinks overall. Uh, comparing the highest quintile to lowest quintile quartile, sorry, quartile, highest quint- quartile to lowest quartile, the hazard ratio, the subdistribution hazard ratio is one point three nine. Right. Right. The confidence interval did include the null, but as you know, that's not Right, problematic doesn't, doesn't, to me. It's yeah. it's point nine six is the is the confidence limit. So we're still talking about increased risk here. And then if you look at just the artificially sweetened beverages and prostate cancer, it was one point three three. And this one, this case, it doesn't include the null. And even the third quartile compared to the lowest quartile was one point four one. So so, but I guess, but when you look at the continuous analysis. That's really weird because then it goes protective. Mm-hmm. So well, what not is- just protective, but you would draw a very different conclusion about the sugary drinks except for fruit juices, right? Because when you're looking at the continuous analysis, then the subdistribution hazard ratio is 1.24. So for every 100 milliliter per day increase, it looks like, you know, and it's not statistically significant, right. but it's 0.95. It's, yeah, yeah. yeah. You'd think that that was the, the bad actor, right? Right, right. right. But 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 just to just to clarify what you were saying there is so they looked at this in quartiles but they also looked at it as a continuous measure, and we, as we were just saying the the hazard ratios relating the highest to the lowest quinta, quartile for artificially sweetened beverage was one point three three, but when you looked at this as a continuous measure the hazard ratio for how much of an increase is it one hundred milliliters per, per day yes, one hundred milliliters per day which I assume is. 10 gallons? What's that? <laughs> that's that's a, I, I don't a, know what a that glass is. of juice. A glass of juice, okay. Uh, <laughs> the increase, uh, the, it's protective. Right. Uh, yes. It, it goes is. from being harmful in the quartiles analysis. Right. All three quartiles have increased risk, not much in some of the lower ones, but to suddenly being protective. So what, what, uh, what? Right. So I'm is lost. this telling us that, that, that if this, if you were a man, you should have Diet Coke with breakfast. And if you're a woman, you should have a glass of orange juice. This is. This this Chris is starting. Gill's nutritional school. This is starting to get really uh, the Gill diet puzzling, shall we say? And 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 also the fact that these you know the continuous versus the quartile data. I mean, I I actually kind of wonder whether that might be a typo that it should have been a one one point five seven because it would certainly make more sense. But the, the confidence intervals don't. Confidence that intervals that. don't suggest I, that that's a typo. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. I don't I don't get it. I don't get it unless there's some odd curve in these responses that we're not picturing up in the quartile analysis. You know. <sighs> I think this is a case where these were, when looking at prostate, there were 291 cases diagnosed over only, you know, five and a half years of follow-up on average. And these guys are pretty Pretty young. young. Um, You know, the men were a little older, but they were 47 at baseline on average. That's very, very young. And Mm -hmm. I think this is a situation where I would be a little concerned about reverse causation. You know, maybe if you Mm -hmm. have some prostate symptoms, you you change your, you know, the types of beverages that you're consuming. So yeah, so I agree. The the prostate results are, are very, very strange. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, so I went back and forth on this one. I mean, I, I sort of was writing down my notes and I was thinking, oh, there's a positive or there's a negative. There's a positive, there's a negative. And I, I ultimately land, you know, I'm, I, do we know anything? Do, do, I, do I either of you know whether... Um, I've given up knowing anything. Well, that's this, fair. This podcast has convinced me that we know nothing. You know, so they start off by making this argument that we have reason to believe that that breast cancer could be affected by sugar consumption. And that mm-hmm. was the large argument that they made in the beginning. And I read that and I found myself wondering, is this 
really the case that you know we know we have a reason to believe it could be breast cancer and it turns out to be breast cancer or is this a an after the fact we write our introduction and we we already know that we found a relationship between breast cancer so we lay out this mechanism i i don't know the answer to that but i found myself a little bit in the harking. Yeah. I mean, I think there there is some evidence, you know, from animal models and also from the prior, you know, human studies suggesting that there there could be reasonable mechanisms to explain an association between sugar and breast cancer. So I don't think that was just right. post hoc hand waving. Okay. I think that that's a thing. Fair. Fair Can I enough. tell you my favorite thing about this study? Yes, please do. I love that in the methods they explained what fine and gray regression was mm-hmm. and how to interpret the relative risk estimates. You want to say something about that? You want I would to love to us? because so this is directed at a recent reviewer two who gave me some comments oh. um, that indicated that reviewer two may not understand what fine and gray regression does, but thinks it's like a magic cure-all for competing risks. So, Can you just say what competing risks are for? Yeah. So when you're looking at, say, incidents of a specific type of cancer, before developing that cancer, someone might die of another cause or develop a different cancer, which would then make them sort of ineligible to have your primary event. So that would be a competing risk. And so your regular Cox models give you cause-specific hazard ratios. Fine and gray regression gives you sub-distribution hazard ratios. And the authors tell us that this model, this now I'm quoting from the article, estimates the absolute incidence of the uh, event of interest, allowing us to model directly the association between the exposure variable and the rate of cancer accounting for competing risks and allowing a direct but non-numeric inference on the risk of cancer. Thus, sub-distribution hazard ratios can be interpreted as the change in cancer rate according to the sugary drink consumption in patients who are, are either event-free or who have experienced a competing event. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a funny thing, right? You're assuming, so even the people who have experienced the competing event are still included in that comparison, mm. even though they can't develop your event of interest. Okay. okay? I mean, that's right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just whereas, whereas the hazard ratio is just comparing the instantaneous rate for people who have not yet had the your event. event or any other events, right? That's the, that's the difference. Okay. So it's a sort of it's like a form of censoring in a way or not? It, it, I mean, it, it, it's dealing with, yeah, it, it, it's a way of dealing with competing types of, of events. But it doesn't do exactly what I think many people think that it, that it does, right? So, right. They, so then they go on to say a subdistribution hazard ratio greater than one reflects an increased risk. And a subdistribution hazard ratio less than one reflects a decreased risk. But you can't interpret those numbers 1.18 as a risk ratio. Oh, interesting. It just means that the direction would be the same as if you had but we can put, a risk we, ratio. So we really can't put a, so, a number on it? So does that mean that, that the 1.3 sound. that they're quoting is not yeah. really what people think it means? It is not a risk ratio. But I believe, And I, it's I, also I, not a hazard ratio. Or an incident rate ratio. Yeah. Huh. Oh, huh. okay. Yeah. Ooh. All right. Now I'm even less sure of what we just learned. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me end then with my uh, favorite things about it. First of all, figure one, a pie chart. That's a donut chart. Not, not a donut chart, even, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying, I don't see, I don't see why they, that needed to be in there. But, a lot okay. of sugar the, in that donut. The colors are pretty. I mean, the colors are pretty. They but paid a lot for that, didn't, I bet. Didn't add a lot to my <laughs> understanding of the paper. Uh, okay, you know, as you know, I hate the phrase borderline significant. They, they used it. No, they didn't. They did. The association between sweetened sugar soda specifically and cancer rate was borderline non-significant. Oh, oh, oh <laughs> gosh, you're right. Sorry. <laughs> and then this one, they, they wrote this last line specifically for you, Chris. Finally, this is an observational study. Thus, causality of the observed associations cannot be established and residual confounding cannot be entirely ruled out. Thank you. So there you go. Thank they you. did that yes. for you. They, they knew I was listening. They did. 
All right, so let's let's do we, move on. Do we have any listeners from France? Uh, we're about to find out because okay. they're all about to tune out. They're, they're about, yes, right. They're going to fire us. <laughs> all right. Um, so let's, let's snarky comments let's, about. Let's move on to the second topic, and and th- I should say so. The second topic essentially is a follow on from the first topic, and it, it's based on a paper that we looked at, which I will explain, but I don't think is really where our conversation is necessarily going to go. So, the the article was by David Ludwig Kara. Ebeling and Stephen Hemsfeld in the uh, in JAMA, right? Yeah, it mm-hmm. was in JAMA mm-hmm. in August 12, 2019, entitled Improving the Quality of Dietary Research. So there's been all of this hand-wringing about dietary research, nutrition research being highly problematic. And so they talk about some of the reasons why that may be. And they sort of liken this to drug studies and say, you know, drug studies have these well-defined protocols. They're much simpler to do. There's a lot of drug company money behind them, much easier to implement. Whereas dietary trials, and they're specifically talking about trials here, are much harder to do because there are so many variations on any single diet. The duration of follow-up that you'd actually need for one of these is very long. Uh, There's not a lot of funding available to do long-term dietary studies. And so they make some propositions for how you could potentially improve trials for nutritional studies. But I don't think that's specifically what we care about, right? Because I don't think that there's ever going to be a time when we're doing tons and tons of long-term randomized trials for diets. What I think we care about is how to make observational epi of nutritional studies better. And so I would just sort of throw that question out there is, is... You know, we have spent so many times, and Chris has made me promise we wouldn't do any more nutritional studies, and I snuck this one in just because I thought it was interesting. You know, is it, is it just hopeless? I mean, are, are, if we were to continue to do dietary studies on this podcast, would we continue to just be repeating the exact same messages over and over? Unmeasured confounding, maybe some reverse causation, I don't believe it. Or, you know, or is this particular one an example of a good one and we'd want to follow this? What's the what's the way out of this problem? Uh, I was afraid you're going to say that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know, Jen, do you have any do you want to jump in ahead of me? I mean, I, I, I just feel so cynical about this. Yeah, no, um, but, that's but, clear. But how do we make it better? We got to make it better somehow. I don't think the answer is bigger and bigger and bigger studies. And we've talked about the, the, the fallacy of large numbers. Large numbers are great because they improve your precision, but they don't, they don't deal with bias or the, all the other sort of structural problems. And, and, and you've made the argument many times, Matt, that sometimes having a massive data set with, with you know, you know misleading. N- beautiful little narrow conference zones, it, it gives you a false sense of, of certainty. Yep. But it's, it, they're distinct concepts. Right? Precision yep. is not the same thing as bias or nope. causality. Systematic error and random error are two different. Totally different. different. Yep. So. Yeah, but it, I mean, here's a situation that when we're likely dealing with pretty small effects and, um, you know, that over a lifetime could be very important, but but I think it's hard to find those associations unless you are doing big studies. And I think, you know, the, the point that the authors make about the funding for diet studies, I mean, I think that that's probably not just restricted to trials. I mean, I think that, you know, I think it's it's likely hard to fund these studies sufficiently to have the kind of infrastructure that you need or to be able to do these more mechanistic sub-studies within them, you know, that are expensive, you know, to take those types of measurements on on your participants. You know, I think that's that's a very, it's a fair point. I think to do them well, it requires some some money. Yeah. I, and I, and I, I agree with all that. I started thinking like, so if I was, if I was if I had all the money in the world and I had time to solve this problem, what would I want to see if if we're not going to go into large-scale randomized trials, uh, if we wanted to tease out, say, what's the effect of sugar-sweetened beverages? And I started thinking, okay, so would I have been more convinced by this study that we just looked at if it if it wasn't just sort of one set of analyses, it was sort of a whole bunch of different uh, approaches to the same problem? So I started thinking like... You know, we've read a we've never read a number of nature studies, I think it was, or or science studies from other disciplines where it sort of reads as like a series of experiments building an argument, rather than just a single study trying to analyze a problem. And I think, okay, so if if we really think that sugar sweetened beverages increases your risk for breast cancer, then the first thing I'd want to see is the increased risk that that fits the hypothesis, but also that the data isn't fitting a whole bunch of other hypotheses. Because if if there's 
you know, this confounding, then that confounding should, excuse me, ripple through to other cancers, right? They should all sort of kind of follow a similar pattern. And then, you know, we should see a, a big jump up maybe for one particular type. Then I was thinking, okay, so if there's a mechanism, then presumably we could collect data on what we think is the mediator and, you know, do an analysis in which we right. then could see, do we remove the effect we control for the mediator? And then I was thinking, and then you could add in some kind of negative control type study on top of it where we said, okay, you know, is, is you know, consumption of sugar sweetened beverages also increase your risk for death in motor vehicle accident, which presumably it really shouldn't. Right. And that would tell us about those confounding patterns. I just think I, it seems to me we need something bigger, not bigger in terms of numbers, but bigger in terms of, of, of approach or, or a radical change. I don't know what it is. I don't know. Well, here, here's a, a couple thoughts. So starting with the last one you raised, you know, are, are there other sort of healthy user effects that one could look at as sort of like a, you know, kind of like a, an internal validity check, right? So why not go, why not do that? Not, why mm. not create these dietary studies that would include a bunch of healthy user effects that we believe a priori have nothing to do with the, the outcome of interest, yeah. but could be used as a barometer for whether this is likely driven by behavior or, or relationships of within competing risks or, you know, or, or not. And so that would give you some sense. A another way one might approach this is to say that all of these dietary studies are hypothesis generating. You should be very cautious. Now, the, the problem is that we, we can't easily test those in randomized controlled trials. It would just be like with 3,300 different nutrients here. That's a lot of randomized control trials one could construct. But you could take the ones that look really important and maybe put those into animal models and test them mm -hmm. again experimentally. And you could say, well, mice are not men, rats are not mice, bunnies are not rabbits. But you could do multiple animals. You could do... <laughs> bunnies are not rabbits? <laughs> um, or, they might be. <laughs> You're right. I'm thinking ferrets. Anyway, bunnies are not ferrets. They are not ferrets. As far as I know, ferrets will eat the bunnies. But the um, but you could test it in animal models, mm -hmm. and then then and now you you know especially if you did it across multiple animals, then you could sort of like say, well, it doesn't work in a mouse because their biology is different, but rats are different from mice, and ferrets are different from rats. So if you get the same sort of null signal across multiple animals, then you that is a, a relatively inexpensive way of testing the plausibility think, of the hypothesis I, came out of I'm, the epi. I'm very skeptical for cancer because. You know, I mean, I think the mouse prostate very different from the human prostate, right? I'm not sure True. that I so would I've be heard. I would be uh, compelled anymore from from those types of results. I mean, I think it's important to have a, a mechanism, mm. but I think this is the case where it should go in the other direction, right? Those studies come first; those are hypothesis generating. Then you do good studies in humans, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some good observational studies, maybe randomized studies, and maybe randomized studies that have more specific research questions. Not does sugar sweetened, you know, do sugar sweetened beverages cause cancer, but in specific patient populations yeah. or in yeah yep. yeah i agree it's it's not it's not clean the, either way you go with the with the animal model it's 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 unsatisfying right yeah. i mean it's yeah. it's so hard but 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 even there we're not we're not quite done because there's a third option and we can put all these together which, which is is exploring these biological pathways and so like in this mm. current paper they talked about the adiposity index and they did, they actually measured it directly but but when when i drill down into the into the fine print of the res results the difference between the highest and lowest quartile in terms of their impedance was very very subtle. It was like 7.43 versus 7.37. It was like almost identical, actually, for the highest to lowest. So you're thinking like, you know, that was their their strongest argument in the intro about the biological pathway that they were exploring. And yet it didn't really pan out in the actual measure. So you're saying, well, then, then how did we get from A to C if B didn't really mediate? You know, that, that again made me yeah. doubt more than confirm my... I mean, it was, it yeah. was great that yeah, they yeah. did it. I totally agree it was great that you did it. But it, it, the result made me less persuaded rather than more. Yeah. So let me, let me, let me just end with just one last thought, which is, so then uh, I still think that I still don't want to give up on this idea of doing trials of dietary studies. And I know you and Don expressed some skepticism about the fact that if you do trials of diets, you're never going to do a long-term dietary study that you would really need. But I, I like, I keep coming back to this idea of the, 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 the trial version of many of these studies isn't just consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages, it's can we convince you to stop consuming sugar-sweetened beverages? Mm -hmm. Which ultimately, if we can't do that, it makes no difference as to whether we can find, you know, the sugar-sweetened beverage is bad for you or is good for you. Ultimately, what matters is 
can we change your behavior and lead to an impact on your health? And so it seems to me there is an important place for these trials because at the end of the day, these studies that we're looking at, these observational studies, don't actually tell us whether or not we could change anyone's health. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, well, we have not solved the problem yet, we, Matthew. No, we haven't. But I feel like we're making progress, <laughs> don't you? Don't you? Yeah. All yeah, right. I so sure let's do. let's move on to our last segment, our amazing and amusing, our favorite segment. Jen, you you wanna you wanna lead us off this time? Sure. I have just a little something. So, so do I. So. so so if you also have a five year old son who requests avocado toast mm. for breakfast in the morning. Not. My kids yeah. won't eat avocado. Uh, yeah. This, my mother came to visit and for just a few days. And when she left, he was requesting avocado toast and green tea with mint for mm. breakfast. Is he, is he a hipster what, now? I don't know. Does he have a beard? I don't know what, don't know what she did to him. <laughs> anyway, so I have noticed the uh, price increase in avocados that has occurred over the past year. You guys I look heard about totally this. puzzled. No, no, I did hear about this, but I have to admit, I don't, uh, I'm going to be totally honest here. I don't pay attention attention to how much things I cost in the grocery store, because I feel like if I did, it would drive me crazy. Right. So, um, so this is one that I didn't know. And I had read a little bit about, so between July, 2018 and July, 2019, avocado prices, uh, per avocado rose from a dollar 17 to $2 and 10 cents. Wow. And they actually ended up at the highest price they had ever, ever been in, in, um, more than a decade. I told you we should wow. buy into avocado futures. Yeah. Um, so it's mainly due to increased demand. So, you know, oh, the fact the that my, yeah, well, and, and five-year-olds <laughs> uh, eating avocado toast has not helped this problem. Did and you then, drive the problem? <laughs> yep. Single-handedly. Single-handedly? Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. And then the California crop was particularly bad this year. I did hear that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so then in Mexico, it's apparently quite seasonal. So 90% percent of our avocados come from Mexico yep, yep. and um, the summer is not their highest production, highest yield time. And so now apparently they've started to decrease. So fear not. Okay. Okay. But, but that's not my thing. No. So, but in order to, <laughs> in order to uh, create avocado breeding programs, which could be used to address this issue, you need to sequence the avocado genome. Oh. And that was just done. Wow. So it's a Whoa. paper. Yeah. Wow. So Wait, this, sorry. Why do you need to do this? Well, so if you wanted to conduct like genome-wide association studies to identify certain traits the of best. avocado oh, that might avocados. be desirable. How to make them yummier. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Tastier or just heartier or Not so mushy so fungus soon. avoiding. Mm. You first need to sequence the genome. So a group did that and it was published in PNAS in August. Um, and they found a couple of interesting things. The Haas avocado, which here in the U.S. Yeah. we're most familiar with, has an ancestry that's 61% Mexican, as expected, but 39% Guatemalan. Really? Mm. Yeah. And they could also mm. tell from the huge chunks of contiguous DNA that it's actually a relatively recent hybrid. So, so sometime be, in the 20th guacamole. century. It's, it's Guatemala. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. Wow. That is pretty cool. Yeah. That is wow. really cool. I don't even read the International Journal of Avocado Studies. <laughs> that is... You should. I, I really love, should. I love avocados. All right, Chris, what do you got for us? Oh, uh, also South American themed. All right. Um, and and, and uh, this is very, very Maybe brief. we'll get some South American listeners now. Sure, sure. Uh, maybe from... Maybe some Incas. Because mm. that's what I'm going to talk or about. Or more briefly. Norwegian listeners after my Norwegian translation there. Yeah, Thor Heyerdahl. <laughs> Kontiki. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> don't know. You don't know the Kantiki? No, it's I couldn't even story. go there. Okay. It's a great okay. story. No. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great example of pseudoscience, and maybe you should talk about that one instead. Okay, next but it's time. Really next good. time. Anyway, so um, uh, growing up, I really loved Tintin stories, uh, and one of the best ones is, is the you know uh, the Prisoners of the Sun, uh, where he goes to the Incas and is captured, and you know it's a very very cool story. Now. So Machu Picchu sort of segues out of that because Hergé was very interested in Machu Picchu, which was on everyone's mind because the city of Machu Picchu had been discovered in around 1912 or something by a, an, ar- an archaeologist from Yale. A guy okay. called whatever his name was. We'll call um, him Larry. Doesn't matter. Larry, yes. Archaeologist Joe. Um, and, <laughs> Indiana and, Jones. And so they found, the, they found this lost city, which was totally covered with vines. And of course, you know, the people who lived there 
knew about it. So it was not like it was discovered. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They knew perfectly well mm-hmm. that there was a city up in the, in the Andes. But the, 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 the interesting part about it is that the West did not know, and the Spanish conquistadors back in the 1500s did not know. So it was undefiled. And this, this uh, city was built around the 15th century. It was a palace for the emperor Pachacuti, and it was active for about 100 years and then it was abandoned. Okay. Now, if you've seen photographs of Machu Picchu, you know it's like lots of rock, big, big rock. And it's up on top of craggy Andes mountains, which are all granite. And so a bunch of, of, of archaeologists, geologists, excuse me, were doing satellite surveys of the Andes. And they noticed that there were all these tectonic fault lines that were you know, driving through the Andes, which is no surprise because that's mm-hmm. why the Andes are there because right. they're driven up by tectonic faults. Now, a bunch of these big tectonic fault lines crisscross, creating a bullseye right in the center of Machu Picchu. Oh. Which means that Machu Picchu is like earthquake central. It's right? not long. Um, and it means that that is the point where big fault lines are grinding against each other. So you, you would sort of wonder, like, why would you build it there, mm-hmm. given that it's going to, like, get smashed to bits by earthquakes? And their argument was that the Incas, that was precisely the point, because the, the, the key ingredient for making Machu Picchu is busted up rocks. And they had a lot of busted up rocks. Because of all the earthquakes. Because of the fault lines and because of the earthquakes. And so they didn't have to like start with giant, you know, 500,000 pound boulders. They had lots of little pieces already lying everywhere that they could use to build the city. I was like, Wow. Actually, that was very pragmatic of them. Plus, because it creates all these fault lines, you have all these crickly cracks and crags and gullies leading every which way off of Machu Picchu that direct the water and act like natural gutters so the place doesn't flood when it rains. Ah. So I was like, huh, you know, uh, you know, you're sort of one person's disadvantage is another one's like dream come true in terms of architecture. That's very cool. I thought it was very cool. I thought you were going to tell me that the the reason they put it on the fault line was because they were risk takers. They were. They were. And they wanted this thing to be there and just, you know, get destroyed someday. Right. We're going to build our new house on Cape Hatteras, by the way. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> no All problem. Right. All right. Uh, so, I have, I have a, uh, I've got a short one, and it's going to follow a theme that uh, I will come back to next time in that um, I'm looking at uh, acknowledgement sections. Do you guys read the acknowledgement sections of most papers? Sure, sometimes. I do. I, I typically don't. I kind of skip right over them. I think them. they're a little sweet. I, I like to know why. And what's the sentimental relationship with this genome-wide association study? Yeah, apparently. Uh, so, so, so this one, so, um, you guys know the bootstrap? No. Yes. No. The bootstrap. I know is what a, it is. I have no idea what it is. All right. Well, it's a statistical method that allows you to determine the, I'm going to get this wrong, but to, 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 to determine the, the variance in any particular data set without calculating it directly, but actually by, by simulating it anyway, developed by this guy, Efron in the seventies, I think, is that about right? Am I even right. close? Nora? Um, Nora it, Efron? No. No, I'm pretty sure it was not. You're <laughs> okay. close, though. Okay. Probably a cousin. Okay. And the the beauty of this thing was that it allowed you to solve, to, 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 to determine the variance of things that you couldn't easily determine formulaically, figure out. The, it, it's it's pretty pretty damn amazing. Clever. So in the, now, what I don't know is whether this was from the actual paper itself where he introduced the bootstrap or whether it was from another paper, but he wrote in... One of his acknowledgement sections, he says, I am grateful to Professor Rupert Miller and David Hinckley for numerous discussions, suggestions, and references, and to Joseph Verducci for help with numerical computations. The referees contributed several helpful ideas, especially concerning the connection with Hartigan's work and large sample theory. I also wish to thank many friends who suggested more colorful names than the bootstrap, including the Swiss Army Knife, the Meat Axe, Swan Dice, <laughs> Jack Rabbit, and my personal favorite, the Shotgun, which, to paraphrase Tukey, can blow the head off any problems if the statistician can stand the resulting mess. <laughs> so there you go. People I who love it. have a, a, a sense of humor about these things put it into the acknowledgments. I love that. I have to admit, I have never, I, I have one paper. That is a lighthearted paper that is going to come out at some point that we did write some amusing things in the uh, acknowledgments. But other than that, I've never, never done that before. Hmm. I love it. I'm going to try to. Well, that is the end of our program. If you've got any feedback on this or any other episode or you want to suggest a topic for us to take on, you can tweet us at at PopHealthEx or you can tweet me at at ProfMattFox or Chris at ID.Gill or... 
What's your Twitter handle? Uh, you don't know. Jennifer R. Ryder. At Jennifer R. Ryder. Or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website. We would like to thank Leslie Talalian, Director of Lifelong Learning at the BU School of Public Health for supporting the podcast. And Nick Guler for tolerating the podcast cart and for the sound and editing. So thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope you will download our next episode. Mm-hmm.